Um, wait a little bit, I'd say. Okay. okay. Try it out. Have at it. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our first Feministing Hangout. Um, we are live and on air. We've never done this before, and we're, we're so excited to get started. But um, please uh, hang in with us. We're, it's our first time, so we're hoping um, everything goes smoothly. Uh, before I introduce everyone else, I'll say that my name is Juliana. Um, I'm a contributor with Feministing, and um, I run my own blog called Latina Feminista. So uh, this issue is, is really important to me. Um, I'll be your moderator today. Um, so we decided to have this talk today because of a lot of different issues that have been coming up um, in the news. We just closed out Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, um, the, there was a whole controversy about um, Little Miss Hispanic Delaware um, and colorism in that particular situation. Um, I know that I've personally been reflecting a lot about my own the role that my own skin color plays in um, how I um, act out my activism and how my privilege um, comes into play at that moment. So I recently wrote a piece for a feminist team called Solidarity Isn't for Women in the Middle, and that was piece was largely inspired by a lot of the women that are here today, um, or rather I used a lot of their own pieces to, to help me work through those issues. Um, so after writing that, uh, we got a lot of really good feedback, and I wanted to take this um, further than just a post. So we're having a hangout today. So I'd like to uh, welcome and introduce um, these three lovely Latina feministas who are with us. We have um, Ana Cecilia Alvarez, we have um, Daniela Ramirez, and Isis Fernandez Rojas, who are here to talk with us. Um, I'm going to give them all quick little introductions, and um, you'll get to know them as we go throughout the talk. But um, Ana Cecilia is the co-founder and managing blog editor of Blue Stocking Magazines, Blue Stockings Magazine, and mm -hmm. um, she writes on feminism art for the Daily Beast, where she published her piece, um, I'm a White Woman of Color. Um, Isis is a blogger and a longtime journalist, um, and also a self-proclaimed social media queen. I like that title, Isis. Um, she's yeah. also an Afro-Latina with lots of opinions, so I'm really excited to hear from you. And Daniela is an, ex an aspiring writer. Um, she wrote a piece at Policy Mike um, called What It's Like Being a White Woman of Color, um, which had a lot to do with my own piece, too. So. We invited her to talk about it. Um, she has a master's degree in gender development and globalization from the London School of Economics and Political Science. That's a really long title. Um, <laughs> and she's especially passionate about sexual health and reproductive um, rights as a Latina feminista. Also, for some reason, uh, Daniela doesn't have her little lower third going. So if you'd like to um, tweet her any questions uh, while you're watching, you can tweet her at uh, danram, D-A-N-R-A-M, 910. Did I get that right? Yep. Yep? OK, great. So. Um, and also during, during the tweet, for anyone who's watching, please feel free to tweet us questions or comments about what you think um, what, about what we're saying. We're using the hashtag ColoringLTD, which is supposed to stand for uh, Coloring Latinidad. Um, you can also tweet us at our personal handles um, and, of course, at Feministing. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, just to sort of open up the discussion, I'd love if you would all talk about um, how you think your own skin color shapes your Latina feminism? Who should go first? <laughs> <laughs> how about you, Isis, since you started talking? <laughs> oh, sure. Of course, the first one who goes talking. <laughs> talking. Um, my skin color, um, what was the question shaping my Latina um, feminism? feminism? Well, I think it does everything. Um, it's uh, being Afro Latina, I know. Um, Growing up for La uh, for Latina, it's 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 interesting because when you see what's on the media for Latinos, um, you don't see yourself, and so you 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 wonder if you even exist sometimes. Um, especially, I grew up in East Terrace County in the '80s, so um, I grew up in in suburbia, and so you know we were one of the first um, families of color in our neighborhood, um, which was back then a relatively new neighborhood. So it was it was interesting growing up not really seeing a people who look like me in any capacity 
and B, people who look like me and spoke Spanish and knew about the customs mm. and, and whatnot. Um, and how it shapes it for me, it, it, for me, when I think about feminism, I think about um, a journey, a journey into finding who you are mm. and, and what you're about. And color has everything to do with that for me. Um, since then, I mean, because I grew up not really around a bunch of other Cubans or a bunch of other Guatemaltecos, you know, I have drilled my parents for information. I have drilled others for information. Of course, growing up in Houston, I mean, I think everybody grows up Mexican at one point because there's so many of them, you know, in, in Houston. And so, you know, I know, I know the, uh, I know the, um, the uh, the national anthem for Mexico better than some <laughs> folks who are from Mexico, you know. And wow. so it just, for me, it's, it's a lot of just uh, of learning and being very very um, very strong in my knowledge and not allowing anybody to write my story for me, and that's extremely important for me. That's awesome. Thank you. What about you, Anna? Cecilia, Anna, Cecilia. Sorry. Um, it's funny because for me, I, um, and I wrote about this in this piece, I had very difficult troubles relating my Latinaness with my color um, to the point where I felt that similarly my skin of color maybe made me feel less Latina um, in a very different way, I think, than ISIS. I mean, I grew up in Miami. I grew up in Mexico and then moved to Miami um, and lived in a mainly white, Hispanic neighborhood. Um, Surrounded by Cubans, strangely enough, so I was I was the all one out as when I'm Hicana. Um, <laughs> but in but in that sense, there I I never really I identified more with my whiteness than with my Latinaness, and didn't particularly identify as Hispanic or of color. Um, and then when I slowly started moving away those mainly Latina communities, I started seeing how, in fact, even though even though my my skin gave me a certain privilege, it still didn't erase my ethnicity, if you will, and I kind of had to grapple with how both were being read differently. Um, and that's more of my identity. With my feminism, I kind of always felt that my skin color put me in this an ambiguous space where I couldn't really find a voice to identify with similarly, um, mainly because I, I, I could never really ignore the privilege that I received from my skin color, and therefore any identification that I could have with women who are of color, who have had different issues in being Latinas, I kind of felt... Um, unable to like, claim that identity. Um, like I remember at you know in school there were groups for Latinas or women of color that I, I just couldn't feel that I was able to enter just for myself. Um, so yeah, it's something that has been very it's been very related but often at odds. I I mean it's it's interesting because I have I feel like I have seen my identity reflected in what a Latina could be as far as like the like the white skinned Latina that's normally seen in, in media or in television, um, but at the same time when I go to my spaces of activism or feminism particularly, I often feel like I have to step away from my identity as Latina in order to, um, yeah, to acknowledge the privilege that I am afforded in other spaces for being fair-skinned. Um, so it's, it's kind of, there's a tension there always with, um, I think, skin color and the ethnicity behind being a Latina woman. Yeah, absolutely. I can really relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Daniela? Um, so, I believe the question was on my Latina feminism, my skin color bringing me to my feminism or Latina feminism. Yeah. Um, so for me, I'm in some in some similar ways to Anna Cecilia, it, coming at it from a different angle. Whereas, obviously, I've always been Latina, and it's not something I've ever been ashamed of or at all, but it just wasn't how I particularly identified, and I came into my feminism much earlier on, and it was through exploring that feminism and intersectionality and race and issues of race and class that I started to see myself more in that. I grew up in a very predominantly white neighborhood, and it wasn't until I went to college that I particularly felt made to feel different than my predominantly white peers. And I was trying, people were trying to pigeonhole me into these, like, Latina student groups, that kind of thing. Um, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but it just wasn't a part of how I identified. And so now, in coming to it from my feminism and through a feminist perspective, it is something I, I am proud of, obviously, and do want to engage more on Latina feminism and what that means. 
Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so it, it sounds weird to say that I didn't always identify as one because, of course, I've always have been. Um, but it, it is a newer area of exploration mm -hmm. for me and trying mm -hmm. to deal with my own personal identity of being both white and Latina and what that means um, in general, but in the feminist world as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Those are, wow, what a great way to start off. Um, I thought that Isis brought up an interesting point, and I thought it would be interesting if we could explore that a bit more. Um, I'm curious to hear, because we come from such a, a different spectrum of experiences um, mm -hmm. of colorism within Latino feminism or within the Latino community, um, in what ways do you think that the mainstream media is misrepresenting what you see reflected within your own community or how you've experienced your Latinidad? Hmm. Well, that's interesting to, that's interesting, an interesting question since I, I technically work in that media. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but um, I can come at it from other types of media, which, you know, I'm, I'm HuffPost is fantastic in, in trying to give as many people voice a voice as possible, which I think is, is what's missing. Um, and I think what needs needs to happen. Um, and I think it's a, uh, do I see me, my Latinidad reflected in the pages and in the images of mainstream media in the United States? No, I do not. Um, do I think that it will be one day? I think yes, it will. And I think that I, I love that we have Fusion and I love to have NBC Latino and we have Fox Latino and we have um, outlets that are essentially proving that there is a market out there and that there is readers and there are viewers and there are people who want to know what is happening in these communities. Um, but as of right now, no. Um, but just like there's me, just like there's my friends who are in mainstream media, we try it. We try to change that from the inside. You know, try to go. Um, Cover the stories that are not typically covered, and covered in covered in the depth and um, with the knowledge that it deserves. We try to um, go up the, the the ladder so that we are in decision making roles to cover these communities and to cover um, the issues that happen in these communities. So there is there is it's there. Is it there yet? <laughs> not yet, but it is there. Right. Great. Awesome. Hmm. Who wants to go next? Well, I was um, kind of going on a different track, but maybe on the same question um, with representation. The kind of actually the the issue that brought me to helm with this issue with kind of this question of skin color and ethnicity and Latinaness and how I identified was seeing that maybe less in in mainstream media overall, but within discussions between my other feminists, um, mm -hmm. I kind of saw that there was a real. Um, yeah, there's real kind of like missing conversation about the tension that I felt within myself about being um, a fair-skinned Latina, um, particularly the conversation around solidarity for white women really kind of put in front of me the question of um, if we're really dividing it into these two categories, you know, where where does one fall if one doesn't really fit easily into another. Um, and out of that, and that was kind of something that I felt individually and out of writing that I got many, like a very um, significant and, and I would say also exciting outpour of other women who kind of came forth and said that they similarly felt these contradictions and these and this lack of identification um, with what with the dialogue that was going in within the feminist community itself. Um, so that's like another place I feel where I mean this is why this conversation in particular is extremely relevant and important because it's something that I'm tackled um, or yeah or well addressed within or how we even ourselves talk about feminism. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for bringing up Solidarities for White Women. Um, I, I don't think I made it clear in the beginning that that was a huge inspiration for, I think, a lot of um, our writing and for mm -hmm. this event right now. So, mm -hmm. yeah. If I can add just briefly on that, um, mm -hmm. I did, um, in thinking about Solidarities for White Women and the divide between white women and women of color and all those conversations that it created, which were very important and valuable conversations. Mm -hmm. Part of the issue I had with the reaction to it was that there was sort of speaking to this assumption that there already was solidarity among all women of color. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. 
and I don't see that to be the case. And whereas maybe we or pockets of us, the greater category, are better at solidarity in some ways, um, I don't think that if the only thing that unites us is being separated from white women of color, then I don't, I mean, white women, I don't think that creates solidarity among us in and of mm -hmm. themselves. Yeah. So just something to try and move that conversation forward, hopefully. And I think there is willingness on all parts to do that. But I mean, I know now hosted an event last week where Lori Edelman, one of the doctors of feministing, spoke on the panel on solidarity for women of color. And mm -hmm. I was really hoping to get to that question. It sort of came in at the end, but um, we weren't really able to delve into it further. But anyway, just something yeah. that it made me think of. Totally. If, I could, if I could also add, I think it's really interesting that when you're thinking about color, right, and you're thinking about Latinas of color, um, what we're all technically, I guess, of color. <laughs> That's a misspeak, but yeah. you're talking about um, the those that are in the lighter part of the spectrum and those in the darker part of the spectrum. And if you notice, the issues are so similar, which has you know kind of um, kind of blows me away a little bit because we both feel we're on the outside looking in of our Latinidad and kind of like you know we don't look the typical Latina. You know we don't we don't act like, you know, some of us don't act like the typical Latina. Well, what is the typical Latina? This is just mm -hmm. something somebody else has invented, or the media, oh, again, I work in it, so I, I apologize on behalf <laughs> of them, but um, <laughs> that the media has, crea has created, or that somebody somewhere has created, um, that this is what a Latina looks like, and that everything else is just different, and it's not really Latina. So I think it's kind of mm -hmm. interesting that on both sides of the spectrum, we experience that same feeling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in yeah. fact, I was going to say, my, so my next question is about um, is about the Little Miss Hispanic Delaware beauty pageant. Mm -hmm. um, for, for those of our um, viewers who don't know, uh, this is a beauty pageant for um, young little girls who I are Hispanic, and the winner this year was has a Dominican grandmother who's black, and the winner was uh, Afro Latina, and the um, the pageant asked her to prove her to prove that she was Latina because they didn't believe her, and it's, it's kind of unclear, but every report that I can find says that um, that that was not the case before, that they didn't ask this from anyone else. So recently, um, Nuestras Raices, the organization that um, that put this on, put out a statement saying, "Oh, well, you know, this has been blown out of proportion. Um, we, from now on, will be asking everyone for their um, for proof." In fact, the winner, the current winner, since um, the Afro Latina girl was didn't accept wasn't able to take the crown. Um, the current winner is blonde and blue eyed, and we're even asking her for proof. But when I saw that, I was kind of frustrated because to me it felt like they were just going to the opposite extreme and it was still focusing on this binary of that, like, if you're blonde and white, you can't be Latina. and But if you're black, you can't be Latina either. Latinas only look like this kind of, like, caramel-colored, like, slightly indigenous features maybe uh, somewhere in the middle versus, mm -hmm. you know, I have tons of cousins in Brazil who, like, don't speak English, fluent in Portuguese, and are blonde. Um, and I feel like it really just ignored the diversity that is Latinidad. Um, so I'm curious to hear, hear what you all think, you know, what could we learn from that? You know, I'm not sure that beauty patterns are really the best way to sort of like validate <laughs> one's Latinidad, but like if that's the choice that we have, um, how do you see this uh, going forward? Okay, well, I'll, I guess I'll go first. Because um, <laughs> I, I, I wrote the Huff Post thought right. thing about it. Um, this is how I feel about it. I am actually with um, Miss, Miss, little Miss J's parents. Mm -hmm. um, either you accept me as Hispanic or I'm not Hispanic. I don't have to prove it to anybody. I am who I am. So you mm -hmm. can take your crown and go somewhere else with it. I'm with her, her parents 100%. Um, you, if you didn't if you didn't go do your due diligence before, you can't come in the aftermath um, and then try to fix it. I mean, right. it's, it's just it's just disingenuous. Um, and I think here's what I think about episodes like um, Little Miss Hispanic, and how I think about you know the recent um, 
photos of a certain celebrity who is a little darker in these photos <laughs> for a Halloween costume than she usually is. This is, I think these are opportunities to talk and to talk about color and to talk honestly about color um, and to talk about race and ethnicity because I think we have a lot more in common than we have differences. Um, mm. This is an opportunity to really put everything on the table, you know, like this, this little girl, her parents says she's part Hispanic, I believe her. Of course, I'm, I'm an Afro-Latina, obviously I will, but <laughs> I'm, do I, am I going to question you on your Hispanicness? Or Latina ness? Am I going to question if you are black? Am I going to question that you are white because you look a certain color? Because you're lighter than a paper sack, like for lack of a better term, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. I live in Louisiana, so you know we have a lot of Cajuns here, and so you have people who are dark with blue eyes or green eyes. Are you going to tell me that their their ancestors didn't come from Africa? Are you going to deny one part of them so that way they can pass in another part? I mean, this is these are the conversations we need to have. And if we're going to exist here in this world together in harmony, let's have the conversations and let's get past it instead of staying in the dark and talking about each other behind each other's back. So, mm. sorry, I'm really passionate about this. <laughs> yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah, I um, completely agree. And I think it's interesting, even in the question of beyond just asking how does one authenticate identity um, or you know like how do you prove who you are um, in a way that's not just like coming from what you experience yourself but also who decides the metrics of what is you know an identity or a, um, or yeah like a, a legitimate claim to any title um, and it's an interesting experience even I mean that I myself have felt of, of being told that I, I, certain, I just couldn't be or couldn't call myself a certain thing. Um, it always comes a little bit of, of a of a surprise. It's like, wait, you know, who better to speak of who I am than me, in a way? Um, and I, I mean, at the same time, not to say that there shouldn't be. I think the the exercise of really questioning how the different layers of identity can can, lack of a better word, color your experience of such. You know, I think the example of saying that, yeah, the fact that you are fair skin and you have white privilege does play into who you are, in Latina, but it doesn't make you only less Latina. Um, and it and there are no metrics to measure what that being Latina means except what you yourself want to propose for yourself. Um, I think the questioning is good, but yeah, I think it's better to ask who is setting, yeah, who is setting the parameters of yeah. right. Latina real. It's like very, yeah. it's very <laughs> it seems like there might be a disconnect. You know, I've often argued that, like, uh, I think among liberal communities, we do a lot of talking about self-identification, like, how do you self-identify, like, do you identify as Latina, and, like, in reality, my identity is largely shaped by how people treat me, you know, mm -hmm. like, it's largely shaped by the fact that I often am treated as if I'm white, um, but in certain situations, that's not the case, so I think that there's this disconnect between what we want to admit about how people look, and then how we actually treat people who look that way. You know, so uh, we can say that, like, you, for example, or I, for example, um, am white, but the reality is that I don't walk through the world as white always, sometimes, mm -hmm. but not always. Yeah. Sorry, Danielle, I cut you off. Sure, it's okay. Um, all of this, too, like, points to the larger issues of, of identity, as you said, but two things that it also makes me think of are um, nationality, like, regionally, where you are from, how much of a difference that can make. Like, in writing my piece, I talked a lot with my mother, who's a Colombian immigrant, and, like, in that setting where being Latina is the norm, this idea of what is white, not that it doesn't exist, but that it means something else, and that mm -hmm. being able to privilege from that in that setting and then not here once she moved to the United States is a very... Um, strange and can be disorienting experience, um, but also in terms of identity, I think, and Latina identity especially, is language and the people who are English dominant versus people who are Spanish dominant, and for me, being English dominant made constantly to feel less Latina because of it, and I'm not, I wish that I was fluent in Spanish, and it's not something I'm, I'm against at all, like I think that's great, and I strive to be better at, at that. Um, but that there is a larger population of longer, younger Latinas who are English dominant, who are being made to feel excluded by the mainstream media, to go back to the original question, um, in terms of language. Um, so those were just some things I was 
thinking about as we were all talking. Completely. Yeah, and no, I, absolutely. Go ahead. I was going to even say, too, that I have in an interesting reversal experience some sort of even exotification from my identity in, in the place for, like, yeah, coming out of a a, a non-only white Latina space, um, being having the the kind of like the marker of of being of color, even in a way that was palatable to my white friends, almost added like some sort of extra, I don't know, you know, again, lack of a better word, flavor to what I was perceived to be, um, and the fact too that I was bilingual gave me some sort of like this added extra quality that was really at odds to how I had previously experienced and it just goes to show that yeah any place that you walk through depending on um, what entities are the norm you're being read in a different way I think that's very and the language yeah. is actually yeah, a really big part of it yeah. I think it's a huge part of it right yeah yeah um, so another question I had is I don't know if you've all read but there was a recent study that came out um, that essentially argued that uh, Latinos don't have a, they haven't chosen or agreed on like a clear leader and you know like a clear political leader of who they want to sort of invest their support in and who they believe is really going to lead the Latino community to, I don't know what, some kind of success. Um, <laughs> and the argument really is that, that Latinos are so diverse that it's hard to, to unify, that it's hard to unify behind one person. Um, as Latina feminists, would you would you agree with that? Do you think that um, our our interests and our needs are so diverse that there's really no coming together, or do you see um, you know a larger movement? Do you think that we could fit under like a kind of um what we would call mainstream feminist movement, or do you think we need to have our own? Where do you see us fitting? That's a good question. <laughs> That's a really, really good question. I can see it both ways. Um, I see the whole, you know, because I've said it before, that, you know, we don't have our own MLK or Jesse Jackson or Al Sharpton on this side of, of the color spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, but do we really need a Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, or MLK? I don't know. Um, I do think that we do need something that unifies us, yes. Do we need one particular leader, or is it a group of leaders? Um, just like we have our abuelas, the um, abuelos, um, our great aunts and uncles who unify our families, do we just need folks like that who are unifying our community together um, towards one common goal? Maybe that's it. I, I, I would like to think the, the, the longer that we have here, especially the millennial uh, generation coming up, of which I miss by like a year, by the way, being called a millennial. But, um, you know, but, you know, I kind of sort of consider myself that way because I kind of hang out. But, um, yeah, I mean, the more, the older the millennials get and the more, and because we have a, such a large Latino millennial, millennial population, the more they become adults and know what's going on and see the world for what it is, I, I kind of believe that they're going to be a force to be reckoned with, and they will lead as a group. Um, but you know, that's kind of my two cents. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, it's a really complex question. It's honestly something yeah. I feel like I just write about over and over again with new ideas. <laughs> yeah. What about you two? I mean, I would say, if anything, kind of, again, what Solidarity's Bright Women brought up within the feminist community itself is this idea that there, um, there really can't be no one person who speaks for such a, a broad base of interests and experiences and, and forms of exploitation and demands. And I think a similar um, kind of competition to start within the and I think it's it's these conversations and these kind of opening ups to um, the many yeah the many experiences that we all live can hopefully be a way that we can first identify what goals Latinos need to you know embrace or reach or or get to at some point and then maybe see if there if there could be a person or a leader or maybe simply like a set of principles that can be unifying mm -hmm. guiders and I mean there are issues especially within. Latino immigrants in the states that, you know, are definitely, you know, key immigration reform being 
kind of like the, the first one that comes to mind, but um, I think it would be first kind of talking about what we want and who can take us there. Maybe yeah. just us. Maybe yeah, this is it. <laughs> that's a great idea. So we're, we're coming up on uh, on 30 minutes. I do want to squeeze in one, uh, one question from uh, some Twitter, uh, some tweets, and I'd love to hear um, from Daniela, but let's just uh, we gotta wrap ourselves up. Sure. Do you want me to go first and then the Twitter question? Yeah, please. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree a lot with what Anna Cecilia was saying, and I just don't know, in terms of leadership, like what it would look, what it would look like. Like in terms of feminism, anyway, I don't think that having our own separate feminist movement is the answer. Although unifying together is a powerful force to ensure that Latina issues and Latinas are always incorporated in overarching larger conversations is definitely important and valuable, but I don't see it as a separate movement. And I guess I feel the same way about the larger social justice and, I guess, media issues overall. Um, yeah, and I guess, yeah, that's, I'll, I'll leave it at that so we can get to the question. Yeah. But, um, I, I do think it's an important role um, and one that hopefully we can all help fulfill someday. Or we yeah, are, I mean, we are. Anna I Ryan. think it's a great start, you know. Um, I think that, you know, if we're going to define Latina feminism, it's by the very people who are who are acting it out, right? Yeah. So for our last question, I'd love to hear, like, two points on, uh, we have a question from Bella Vida Leti from Twitter, um, and she asks, Yay. what can we do to advocate uh, for change in perceptions? So, like, one, two points on that. Right. <laughs> right about it. <laughs> yeah. I like it. Yeah. 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 Agreed. Maybe I also... Do. No, go ahead. Yeah, I agree. That's all I'm mm -hmm. saying. <laughs> yeah. And I think also I trying to take that, like, off of off of Twitter and, and blogging, right? Like, that's a, a huge step, but then there's a lot of people who aren't maybe on the Internet. Like, I think that some of the most uh, challenging activism I do is, like, talking to my white grandfather in Arizona about how, like, illegals aren't illegal. In fact, that's not a very nice term in the first place, you know. Um, yeah. So sometimes that's the hardest yeah. part, too. I think also not just um, writing. All of us have, like, are, are now starting to, or at least for me, starting to build a community of Latina feminism, but just in general and integrating mainstream outlets in our writing. So it's not always, like, oh, here are all these Latina voices on this Latina outlet, but making sure that, like, the Latina voice and issues that we care about are addressed in mainstream outlets. And on mainstream issues, like, there's mm -hmm. always not our issues just aren't just our issues. You know, there's a lot of overlap and intersection with other people and other people who are either the same socioeconomically or language-wise or whatever, all the differences and similarities among us, just like trying to be more intersectional going forward, I think is the best way to go about it. I completely, yeah. completely agree. And to kind of explain your thought, I think on the on this side, we have to do a lot better trying to find those voices and put them out so they're part of the bigger conversation. I think one of the, one of the things, The Guardian, I love The Guardian. I mean, you're you're going to always hear me talk about The Guardian because I think they do a lot of things well. And one of the things that they do do well is that um, it seems like every other quarter they have a minority fellowship workshop where they invite you to New York to pitch story ideas and column ideas to the Guardian um, editors and if wow. they choose yours you get published and we're not only just talking about the US now we're talking the world because they're they are a global website you're talking people across the pond will read you people in New Zealand will read you people that you've never heard of will tweet you um, and I think that's that that needs to happen more often where we, we are making, we as mainstream media, we as media are making an effort to find the voices to bring them into the conversation. Yes, that's so perfect. Yeah, yeah so I'm hearing that um, it's basically about inserting our own voices into mainstream conversations and then using the privilege that we may or may not have to leverage other voices. Um, exactly. And I think that's a great way to end. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, as our first time, this was, you know, this took a lot of work getting it together, and we're, we're hoping um, that all of you has enjoyed it, and I'm so glad to have all of you here. Um, for any of our viewers who are watching this later on YouTube, um, please 
feel free to continue the conversation. I know that I'm going to be monitoring my Twitter, and I'm going to keep track of the coloring LTD hashtag, and I'd really encourage the three of you to do so. Um, we're, we're available on Twitter, and we want to answer all of your questions um, and continue this conversation. So if you have comments, that's also great. Um, thank you all so much, and we'll see you on Twitter. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thanks. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye, guys.